Coming up on the program, Brian Lin reports on the U.S. Treasury Secretary's visit to Vietnam. Dan Friedel has a story about an Israeli man being removed from his cave home on a beach. Faith Perlo looks at Lana Del Rey lyrics for everyday grammar, and we continue our National Park series on Wrangell St. Elias in Alaska. But first... U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said the U.S. will seek to develop stronger economic and security ties with Vietnam. Yellen held talks with Vietnamese officials Thursday in Hanoi. Her trip to the Southeast Asian nation came after visits to India and China. In India, Yellen attended financial ministers' meetings of the group of 20 major industrial economies. The U.S. Treasury Department said Yellen met with Vietnamese Prime Minister Phan Minh Chin. During the talks, Yellen told the Vietnamese leader the U.S. considers Vietnam a key partner in advancing a free and open Indo-Pacific, U.S. officials said. Yellen's visit came as the U.S. continues diplomacy efforts that aim to build stronger ties with other countries in the Indo-Pacific area as China's influence grows among its neighbors. Vietnam is also a close economic partner, with our two-way trade reaching record highs last year and the United States serving as Vietnam's largest export market, Yellen said. It is a priority for our administration to deepen our economic and security ties with Vietnam. Yellen visited an electric scooter factory and briefly sat on a new model produced by Celex Motors, a five-year-old Vietnamese company. Yellen said the U.S. is prepared to provide $15 billion to support renewable energy efforts in Vietnam as part of the Just Energy Transition Partnership. This was a promise made by the Group of Seven Economies to help Vietnam reduce its dependency on oil and gas. The countries have offered similar assistance to South Africa and Indonesia. Speaking earlier to a group of businesswomen and economists, Yellen praised growing investments in Vietnamese industries, including computer chips and renewable energy. Yellen's visit is seen as part of new U.S. efforts to balance China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific area. Earlier this year, Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Vietnam weeks after the 50th anniversary of the U.S. troop withdrawal that ended America's direct military involvement in Vietnam. Blinken promised to increase relations to new levels. Yellen also met with the governor of Vietnam's central bank, Nguyen T. Hong. The secretary announced new economic policy talks between the State Bank of Vietnam and the U.S. Treasury Department. Yellen thanked Nguyen for close cooperation between the U.S. and the State Bank of Vietnam on looking at American concerns over Vietnam's currency policies. She added that the U.S. would remain supportive of Vietnam's growth and that close economic ties would help both the Vietnamese and American people. Vietnam has quickly become an important center for big international manufacturers. These include operations in Vietnam for South Korea's LG and Samsung Electronics, suppliers to Apple, 
and automakers like Honda and Toyota. I'm Brian Lin. For more than 50 years, Nisim Kalon has lived in an unusual way on the Mediterranean coast in Israel. He started by setting up a tent on the beach in Herzliya, not far from the city of Tel Aviv. Over time, he started making a cave in the stone cliffs. Little by little, he made a living space. He started to make stairs and windows. He built up the stone walls with glass and colorful tiles he found while walking in the city. Now his home is a tourist attraction. People come to the beach just to see what he has made. But officials in Israel want the 77-year-old to leave. The Environmental Protection Ministry said Cologne's cave home is illegal. The ministry says the cave home makes the traditional homes above his unsafe. They worry the cave damaged the structure of the cliff. Officials sent Cologne a letter telling him to leave, known as an eviction notice. Instead of encouraging me, they're denigrating me, Cologne said. He said his home is safe. It even has electricity, a telephone, and a toilet. He said his home is an example of living without waste. Everything he cuts out of the stone he uses. There's no waste here. That's the logic, he said. The last time the government told him to leave was in 1974. He received a document that said his home would be torn down. But it never happened. He did not hear of any government concerns for almost 50 years. The removal order has been suspended while Kalon appeals the decision. Kalon plans to say the government knew about him for many years. He said the city approved his presence when it connected his home to electric power. He said he wants to die in the home he built for himself. I am ready for them to bury me here, he said. The government said Cologne's home makes the cliff unsteady. Officials are worried about the homes at the top of the cliff. But the government is concerned about more than that. An old weapons production center is only about 400 meters north of Cologne's home. The production center closed 30 years ago after an accidental explosion killed two workers, damaged hundreds of buildings, and broke windows far away. The government worries there are still some explosive devices nearby. In June, an explosion blew a large hole in the sand not far from Cologne's cave. The Ministry of Defense said... There are not supposed to be any explosives in the area. However, no government or private organization has cleaned the area and checked it for explosives since the weapons center closed in the 1990s. Some say the Israeli government is using its concerns about unexploded weapons and the cliff wall to push Kalon out of his home. The local leaders in Herzliya said they have a new place for Cologne to live. But Cologne said he wants to stay. His friends are raising money for his appeal. I'm Dan Friedel. In today's Everyday Grammar, we finish our discussion of the 2019 song Looking for America by singer Lana Del Rey. By making a close reading of the song's words, we will understand more about its sounds and structure. 
A close reading is a deep reading of a story. Works of literature, such as poems, are often the object of close readings. These can include the words to songs. The aim is to understand the writer's intentions by looking closely at the details. Last time we considered the grammar and cultural elements of the song. This time we will talk about the poetic devices and the syllable structure of a few lines. Del Rey uses many poetic devices to strengthen what may be thought of as a simple song. Let's take a look. I flew back to New York City, missed that Hudson River line, took a train up to Lake Placid. That's another place and time where I used to go to drive-ins and listen to the blues. So many things that I think twice about before I do. No, I'm still looking for my own version of America. One without the gun, where the flag can freely fly. No bombs in the sky, only fireworks when you and I collide. It's just a dream I had in mind. In lines one and three, Del Rey uses the same number of syllables, eight in total. I flew back to New York City. Took a train up to Lake Placid. Then in lines two and four, she uses seven syllables. Missed that Hudson River line. That's another place and time where. The relative pronoun where ends the fourth line as it is written. This extra syllable does not match the structure, but as Lana sings, she adds the word where to the beginning of the next line, so we can count it with line five. Now, with the added word of where, lines five and six have fourteen syllables each. Line six just has the added word of no. This addition might have been Del Rey ad-libbing, or speaking spontaneously, without planning. Where I used to go to drive-ins and listen to the blues. So many things that I think twice about before I do. No. Let's move on to other poetic devices. Rhymes are made with two or more words that end in the same sound. Lines two and four share a similar vowel sound, I, with the words line and time. Although they do not end in the same consonant sound, they still rhyme. This rhyming of similar vowel sounds is called assonance. Missed that Hudson River line. That's another place and time. We see in lines five and six two other rhymes created by using the vowel sound oo, with the words blues and do. I used to go to drive-ins and listen to the blues. So many things that I think twice about before I do. Lastly, in lines eight, nine, and ten, Del Rey uses other poetic devices. One without the gun, where the flag can freely fly. No bombs in the sky, only fireworks when you and I collide. It's just a dream I had in mind. In line eight, we see another form of rhyme. With the words "one" and "gun," this is internal rhyme. It is when a writer includes rhyming words within the same line, rather than at the end. We also see in line eight repeating F sounds with the words "flag can freely fly." This is an example of alliteration. Repetition of the first consonant sounds 
in words that are close together. In line 9, we have more assonants with the I vowel, with the words sky, fireworks, and collide. In all three lines, the repetition of the I vowel is seen throughout with fly, collide, and mind, mirroring the sounds in the beginning with line and time. In today's Everyday Grammar, we found more details in Lana Del Rey's song, Looking for America. We considered syllable structure and learned about several poetic devices, such as assonance, internal rhyme, and alliteration. You just heard Faith Perlow present this week's Everyday Grammar. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Hi, Dan. It's great to be back. This is the second part of your close reading of Lana Del Rey's song, Looking for America. This week, you looked more into the sounds and syllables of the lyrics rather than the meaning. Lana Del Rey is a published poet and not just a singer. She is able to really use the sounds of English and poetic devices to get her meaning across. It is such a simple song, but through the close reading, one realizes just how complex it is. So I have a question about a verb that she uses, think twice. What does this mean, and how can we use it? Lana says that there are so many things that she thinks twice about before she does. To think twice about something means that you think about doing something and then you consider it again. You decide whether or not you are going to do the thing, or maybe do it differently. It sounds complicated, but it just means that you reconsider your options. Maybe you are scared about trying something new, or you are hesitant or uncertain in some way. Have you ever had something that you had to think twice about, Dan? Uh, for me, actually, yesterday, I uh, was going to dinner downtown in Washington, D.C., and I was going to drive there. But D.C. is known for having a lot of traffic and not many parking spaces, so I had to think twice about that. I decided to walk, and I'm pretty glad I did. Anyway, thanks for joining us, Faith. Thanks again, Dan. Today, we are visiting a vast and remote park in the state of Alaska. The park is bigger than the country of Switzerland. It is six times the size of Yellowstone. In fact, it is the largest national park in America. Its name is Wrangell St. Elias. Do not worry if you have not heard of America's biggest national park. Most Americans do not know its name. But Wrangell St. Elias contains some of North America's largest glaciers and volcanoes. It is also home to nine of the highest mountains in America. The park extends more than 5.3 million hectares. Four mountain ranges come together here, including the Wrangell Mountains and the St. Elias Mountains. The Wrangell Mountains cover much of the park. They were formed over the last five million years from volcanic activity. The St. Elias Mountains stretch into Canada's Yukon Territory. The Chugach Mountains cover the southern part of the park. The Alaskan Mountain Range forms some of the huge park's northern boundary. The mountain landscape is wild. Much of it is also difficult to reach. Private companies offer flight-seeing tours on planes and helicopters. From high above, visitors witness Wrangell St. Elias' beauty. Rivers and glaciers help tell the story of Wrangell St. Elias National Park. These rivers, with names like Copper, Chitina, Chasana, 
and Chittistone come from the park's many glaciers. They wind through land carved out by other huge glaciers long ago. The Copper, the largest river of them all, flows into the Gulf of Alaska. Other rivers take a more dramatic path. The Chittistone River becomes Chittistone Falls, a 91-meter-tall waterfall that drops over a steep wall. Glaciers cover almost 13,000 square kilometers of the park. In the summer months, the park's rivers carry their meltwater. It is filled with tiny pieces of sand, stone, and other materials. A buildup of this sediment forces the rivers to flow through new channels. This causes the river beds to twist and turn. From up above, these rivers can look like braided hair. One of the park's most striking places is the Hubbard Glacier. It is the longest tidewater glacier in North America. A tidewater glacier is one that begins in a mountain valley and flows all the way to a body of water. The Hubbard Glacier is 120 kilometers long and nearly 10 kilometers wide. It begins on the 6,000-meter-tall Mount Logan in Canada's Yukon Territory. It ends in the waters of a place called Disenchantment Bay. Hubbard was named in 1890 after Gardner Hubbard, the first president of the National Geographic Society. The massive glacier is only getting bigger. Unlike most glaciers, Hubbard is thickening and extending. Other glaciers face melting caused by increasing temperatures. But experts say Hubbard reacts in an opposite way to climate change. As the Earth's temperature rises, the area around Wrangell St. Elias gets more snow and rain. Scientists say this snow and rain is what permits the glacier to grow. Sometimes very fast growth causes huge pieces of ice to break apart from the glacier. Scientists call this calving. The ice creates a thunderous sound as it breaks and falls into the water. Hubbard Glacier's size, beauty, and calving activity have made it popular with park visitors. Large boats travel through Disenchantment Bay, taking passengers close to the glacier. Wrangell St. Elias's system of glaciers and rivers help support animal life in the park. The park's doll sheep may be the most famous animal residents. Alaska's doll sheep are the world's northernmost wild sheep population. About 13,000 doll sheep live within the park's borders. Visitors can look for their white bodies and huge brown horns near rocky mountainsides. Visitors might also see black bears, brown bears, moose, and caribou. Caribou are large North American reindeer with huge, wide antlers. Along the coast, seals and sea lions lie on the ice and splash in the water. Wrangell St. Elias became a national park in 1980. The park's main visitor's center is about 300 kilometers east of Anchorage. The long drive to get to the park is an adventure itself. The trip includes roadside views of mountains, glaciers, waterfalls, and lakes. Its distant location makes it one of America's least visited national parks. About 75,000 people 
visit Wrangell St. Elias each year. By comparison, parks like Yosemite and Yellowstone get about three million visitors each year. Visitors can experience the park's pristine nature as well as its historical areas. The Athabascan people lived in the area thousands of years ago. The park includes sites of their villages and hunting areas. The park also has many historical structures and buildings. The National Park Service says the structures represent periods of exploration, mining, and transportation. One historical place is called Kennecott Milltown. The picturesque town tells a story of westward expansion and discovery. Miners processed nearly two hundred million dollars worth of copper at Kennecott Mines between 1911 and 1938. Many of the buildings that remain in the town have been empty. For sixty years, some are in disrepair. The National Park Service works with the local community to restore and preserve them. Some visitors stay at Kennecott during their trip to Wrangell St. Elias. The family-owned Kennecott Glacier Lodge provides beautiful views of the surrounding glacial mountains. It also gives visitors a chance to try exciting outdoor activities like glacier hiking or ice climbing. Some visitors choose to sleep in the wild outdoors. Private campsites are located in many areas of the park. Some visitors set out on long hikes in the park's backcountry area. Whatever way you visit. The immense and untouched beauty of Wrangell St. Elias National Park is guaranteed to awe. I'm Katie Weaver, and I'm Ashley Thompson.